Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for this webinar today. I hope I can be heard. I hope I'm audible. Loud and clear, Dr. Ari, we can hear you. Uh, super, thank you very much. So welcome everyone to this session on uh, postpartum hemorrhage. And um, like we all know in our medical practice, especially in our obstetric practice, a postpartum hemorrhage is one of the greatest threats to, to maternal survival after delivery. And um, as COGS, and um, we, we are concerned and we'd like to have as much advocacy and as much information about postpartum hemorrhage so that we can all be sensitized and um, we can all we can all pull together in preventing postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, we know that postpartum hemorrhage does not respect CADA. It does not respect age. It does not respect experience. It does not respect color. We say the uterus can be very friendly, but also very unforgiving. And uh, for those of us who have experienced PPH, we know that the uterus can be very humbling as well. So I welcome you once again to this session. My name is Dr. Njoki Fernandez. I'm a consultant obstetrician gynecologist, and I also um, a lecturer of reproductive health at the Kenya Methodist University. And um, I'd like to welcome our esteemed panelist today. You can't hear me. Are you sure? Am I audible? Yes, you are. <laughs> All right. Someone was saying it. Uh, we can't hear me, but if I'm, I can be heard, that's okay. So I um, would like to welcome Dr. Grace Kanye, who is also a consultant obstetrician gynecologist at Marimanti Level 4 Hospital in Karakanithi County. She has had four years of experience in the field serving the rural community in Tarakanithi, and she's very passionate about reproductive health and ensuring equitable access to high quality healthcare services. And she's an advocate for evidence-based medicine and particularly interested in IVF and infertility. So Grace will take us through the presentation and uh, we welcome you to listen. As usual, if you have any comments, you can put them in the chat box and we will address them. Okay, me again here. So Grace, Dr. Tari, yes, good I afternoon. I unmuted on my side, but I can't hear Njoki. Grace, we can hear you clearly. Number okay, just a... Uh, Excuse me, Dr. Njoki, uh, just a small technical hitch on our end from the okay. uh, side. Uh, just a moment while we... All right. If the rest of the audience can hear, please just comment in the chat box. If I'm inaudible, let me know as well. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. We can, I can, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Karibu, Daktari. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry for that technical hitch. As I've been rightly introduced by my colleague, Dr. Njoki, I am Dr. Grace Kanye, um, an obstetrician gynecologist serving in Tarakanithi County at the Marimanti Level 4 Hospital. So today we want to focus for the next one and a half hours on this document that has been released by the World Health Organization titled A Roadmap to Combat Postpartum Hemorrhage between 2023 and 2030. Some few introductory comments that postpartum hemorrhage, which we shall abbreviate as PPH, affects one in every six women giving birth. It is the leading cause of maternal death, accounting for close to 20% of the 
of all maternal deaths globally. Sadly, majority of those deaths will affect women in low middle income countries. And furthermore, majority of those deaths, nearly all those deaths will be um, of all maternal deaths from postpartum hemorrhage will be occurring and do occur in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. What we know is that postpartum hemorrhage is partly preventable. Despite spirited global efforts to address um, this menace, we have not seen results enough to be able to reverse this, um, this trend. What has been identified is that there are key knowledge gaps regarding how best to prevent, detect, and treat postpartum hemorrhage. And that forms the basis for today's discussion. So why is this important? We all know as long as you're working in any obstetric unit, the moment a midwife shouts PPH, it is an obstetric emergency. So then why is this important? Over and above um, the, my introductory comments, we know that postpartum hemorrhage is one of the top five causes of maternal mortality in both high and low middle income countries, but largely in low middle income countries. I've attached a slide that shows the other causes of uh, maternal mortality. As I've indicated, it will affect one in every six women giving birth. But beyond this, postpartum hemorrhage has significant impact on women's physical, emotional, and economic well being, including their reproductive health choices and their position in the family and community, especially so after they have had to undergo a hysterectomy to save their lives. So, to start us off, we'll look at some of the physiological changes during pregnancy that puts women at risk of postpartum hemorrhage. We start with the cardiac system where we know that there will be an increased plasma volume by up to 50%, and that there will be an increased cardiac output by up to 40%, translating to an increase in cardiac output of up to six liters per minute. This then translates to an increase in blood flow to the uterus, reaching approximately 500 to 700 ml per minute. And this then explains why our lady is likely to lose up to 1,500 ml of blood before we can start to see a hemodynamic status changing, especially if she has adequate um, hemoglobin. When we look at the four factors during pregnancy, we do know that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state, and this becomes important. So some of the factors that will be increased to make the hypercoagulable states are factors two, factors five, Factor seven, sorry, seven, nine. Uh, let me check that again. Factors two, factor seven, eight, 10, 12. Sadly, there's also a decrease of protein S and a protein C. But this balance is required. It's almost like nature is trying to balance it out. And we'll see how this becomes important once the placenta has been delivered and we need the placental bed to have the bleeding arrested. During pregnancy, Fibrin deposition in the intervillous space of the placenta and in all the walls of the spiral arteries will occur. What then this means is that there will be an expansion of the lumen to accommodate an increasing blood flow and reduce the pressure in the arterial blood flow to the placenta. Therefore, once the placenta has been delivered, we need a mechanism that can stop that rapid blood flow of close to 800 ml per minute. Otherwise, serious hemorrhage will occur. Myometrial contraction plays a very important role in securing hemostasis by reducing the blood flow to the placental site. This leads to rapid closure of the spiral arteries. And fibrin deposition at the placental bed arresting that bleeding surface. Let's start by definition. Primary postpartum hemorrhage will be that bleeding that will occur in the first 24 hours post delivery. Secondary postpartum hemorrhage is the one that occurs anywhere after 24 hours to 12 weeks after delivery. We have been defining primary um, the postpartum hemorrhage as loss of 500 ml or more of blood from the genital tract following a vaginal delivery and 
loss of more than 1,000 ml of blood following a C-section delivery. However, the American College of Gynecologists in 2017 redefined this classification. And now what we are having is a loss of more than a liter of blood or any bleeding from the genital tract associated with signs and or symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours of birth, regardless of delivery route. You may ask what necessitated this change in the, in the definition. It is in order to reduce the number of women inappropriately labeled with this diagnosis. Who then is at risk of PPH? And as we go through this, I'll be highlighting the four important R's when it comes to prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. Risk factors, um, the lady who is supposed to be preparing for, and this should start from the preconception care. So we know anyone who has a suspected or proven placenta abruptio, and placenta previa, multiple pregnancy due to the overdistension of the uterus, preeclampsia or gestational hypertension, a lady who has a previous history of postpartum hemorrhage, obesity, BMI of more than 35, anemia where the HB is less than nine, a macrosomic baby, prolonged labor, if the lady has had operative vaginal delivery or a retained placenta, they are at risk of postpartum hemorrhage and we should always prepare for them. Let's look at the common causes of postpartum hemorrhage. And I believe majority of us know they are the four T's. Tone, where the uterus is atonic, where the myometrial contraction is not enough, resulting into a soft boggy uterus, accounts for majority of the postpartum hemorrhage cases, taking 75% of the bulk of cases. Trauma to the genital tract, accounting for 15% of the cases. Retained placenta accounts for 10%, and a small 1% where we have now a coagulopathy. We will go through these and how to manage them. In the event of trauma, it could be the laceration, a hematoma, an inversion, or a rupture. The rule has always been to be able to repair them. Where there's a uterine inversion, it's quite rare, but when it occurs, it's important for us to be able to recognize it quickly and more so to suspect it if shock is disproportionate to the blood loss and is to replace the uterus um, gently but firmly and to watch for a visovago uh, reflex. This shows how the um, uterine inversion would uh, present right at the introitus, we'll be seeing a bulging mass. And this shows how with a gloved hand, and it's good to actually use something that will relax the uterus. Halothane gas does wonders in this case. And to firmly, gently evert the uterus back. That's a diagrammatic representation of how that's done. Always to ensure adequate analgesia and relaxation. Where we have retained tissue, we always want to examine the placenta to confirm all the cotyledons are present. It's usually a diagnosis of exclusion. After we have addressed the tone of the uterus and any trauma, the placenta in some cases may be invasive where we have been able to diagnose that prenatally, then this is a delivery that should be planned for by a qualified OB, availability of blood products with capable surgical um, capabilities, and again, adequate analgesia if exploration is needed. Where the placenta has been retained, the diagrammatic representation shows digital exploration of the uterus to remove retained products of, um, of, of that placenta and the membranes. Again, to always make sure that we have administered adequate analgesia by the bedside, this can be done by the bedside, to gently explore the uterus and remove all the cotyledons that will have been remaining. Uh, where the issue is thrombin, um, the, one, the less than 1%, it could be either be inherited or acquired bleeding diastasis. And this mostly will result from severe reduction of clotting factors due to persistent heavy bleeding and hemodilution of the remaining clotting factors. Again, we'll see how to go through this. This is just um, an introduction of it. Management of the coagulopathy, we always want to treat the underlying disease process. Serially evaluate coagulation status, replace the appropriate uh, blood components, the ratio of red blood cells to fresh frozen plasma to platelets six, four is to one. We will see how the massive transfusion protocol can be instituted. 
So again, this is a diagrammatic representation, trying to let us know what could be the cause of the four main causes of PPH. If it's torn, it's over distension of the uterus, either polyhydramnios, macrosomic baby. It will also be from intramniotic infection. Um, important to note for the ladies who present with pre-labor rupture of membranes, if this has been prolonged by definition more than 18 hours, if she's running fevers, if there's any anatomic or functional abnormality of the uterus, which could lead to either rapid labor or prolonged labor, a patient who has fibroids, we know is usually at risk of PPH, where we have placenta previa, we always know that patient is at risk of PPH and how we prepare for them. Where we have used uterine relaxants, let's say we're trying to buy some little bit of time by chocolizing the uterus, that's a patient at risk. Where we have bladder distension, and that's why the primary, one of the primary key things in management of PPH is always emptying that bladder. And after delivery, we always encourage our ladies to empty their bladder, not having to wait for the sensation of a full bladder. Um, risk factors for trauma, dental tract injury, lacerations on the cervix, vaginal or perineum, commonly occurs in a patient who has precipitous uh, delivery, precipitate labor. And that's why when you're clucking the patient at admission, you always want to find out, can you remember the duration of your last labor? Anybody who tells you it was way too rapid, I was admitted at six centimeter within four hours I had my baby, always have at the back of your mind, this could be a client who is at risk of PPH where we have had to use a vacuum delivery. Again, this could be a risk factor for PPH due to tears within the genital tract system, um, where we have a deeply deep arrest of the um, presenting part as an indication for going in for cesarean section. We always have to remember that once we make the loitering segment in, uh, incision, as you're trying to disimpact the deeply engaged presenting part, we could end up with lacerations uh, going commonly on either side of the uterus. Uterine rupture for women who have had either one or two previous cars and are attempting a repeat vaginal delivery and supervised, they always need to know, let always come to the hospital if you want to have a trial of labor of scar. And it's important to mention here, for ladies who have had previous C-sections, let them be marked as high risk for PPH, especially for the facilities that do not have theater capabilities. And for these clients to always be transferred, you know, transfer your ANC care early enough to a facility that can offer theatre services, so that we plan for their deliveries. What we uh, what we commonly uh, call the birth plan, so that she knows by week thirty nine we're offering an elective cesarean section, where there has been a prior history of a uterine rupture at week thirty six. We want to plan for this delivery. Uterine inversion: the ladies who are likely to be at risk are the women of high priority and where there has been an excessive cord traction, uh, commonly where the cord is short. The abnormalities of coagulopathy can affect women who either they know themselves, they have a pre-existing condition, either hemophilia A or nubrin factor deficiency, or women who have had a previous history of postpartum hemorrhage. The other women at risk, um, an acquired condition during pregnancy is where we have gestational thrombocytopenic scapula or preeclampsia, which has developed the health syndrome. Other um, events that can lead to coagulopathy during pregnancy is that we, the patient develops amniotic fluid embolus, where there's an abruptio, especially the concealed type, where there's severe infection, where, and we end up with neutrophilia and or neutropenia, where we have had an intrauterine fetal death. Always remember to run a coagulation screen for these women before we plan for that delivery. So let's individualize uh, the discussion to the four main causes of PPH. Remember we say that what has been identified uh, from the WHO is that there's, there are key knowledge gaps regarding the best practices to prevent, detect, treat, and manage PPH. And again, what I indicated is that as we go through this presentation, I want us to have the four R's of management or preparedness for PPH which is one that we are able to be ready as a unit. We are able to recognize a PPH has occurred. We are able to respond and manage it and we are able to report it. I'll give a summary of this towards the tail end of this presentation. Uterine atony accounts for 75% of all the cases of postpartum hemorrhage. The diagnosis is usually generally made when the uterus does not become firm after routine management of third stage of labor 
aka Amstel. And Amstel has three active components with delivery of the anterior shoulder. And after confirming exactly a singleton pregnancy, we administer oxytocin 10 international units IM. Again, this oxytocin needs to be one that has actually come right out of the fridge to maintain the cold chain. Then we practice delayed cord clamping for at least one minute where the baby does not need immediate neonatal resuscitation. Then we have controlled cord traction. I'll use an image to, uh, to demonstrate this brand maneuver. When it has been confirmed, that the postpartum hemorrhage is due to uterine atony, then we know they are mechanical, pharmacological, and surgical management of it. Important to state here, we cannot manage PPH as an individual. It is team effort. So the soonest you have been able to recognize it, then we shall shout for help. And the help then means if, and I know because I work in a county hospital, how the staffing is, it is then to call for the extra pair of hands in the next ward, or perhaps even in casualty. Alert the medical officer on duty to be on, on standby and to come and assist with the resuscitation. The MO should also call for the other medical officers and the obstetrician on duty. We then need to inform the anesthetic team that we have a patient we are managing for postpartum hemorrhage. In addition, let us also be informing the pharmacy team because there are certain drugs that perhaps we don't keep in the labor wards. But once we address how to get ready for them in terms of getting our trays ready, maybe these drugs will start being kept. But if we don't inform the pharmacy team, we have a lady with PPH, we are likely to need the following drugs. Inform the blood transfusion unit. I know where I work, we don't have that, but inform the lab team, we need blood. All right. So number one, um, call for help, a multidisciplinary team. Then once the person has called the code for PPH, always have a team leader who will direct the resuscitative efforts. So one of them is supposed to be assessing the patient. Vital signs are very important and we'll see how these can actually be used as part of the meals chat to be able to be picking this lady long before we can see the bleeding on the floor. So blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, peripheral oxygen saturations, urine output. And these are quite important as we'll see in, in the upcoming slides. So we have the modified early warning score, it's the rule of 30, that by the time the patient has lost 30% of blood, there's likely to be an increase in their pulse rate by 30 beats per minute. Their respiratory rate is likely to be 30 breaths per minute or even low, more. The systolic blood pressure is likely to have dropped by 30 millimeters of mercury, and their urine output will have come down by 30 ml per hour. By this time, this patient is likely to have lost more than 30% of her hematocrit. This um, shock index, which is a pulse rate divided by the systolic blood pressure, has been found to be a very important indicator of the state of shock and the urgent need for resuscitation. A normal um, index will be 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. In pregnancy, we, as we adjust for the physiological changes of pregnancy, will be 0 0.7 to 0 0.9. But anything of 0 0.9 will be having our alarm bells ringing that we have a mother who needs to be rescued. I've attached the paper, uh, which we can read much later on. Being able to recognize that our mother is bleeding, then that means we are able to call for help Urgently, I've attached a um, pictogram that we can use to be able to tell how much the mother has lost. Um, if it's the sanitary towel, which we call the maternity pad, by the time it's filling up, it's 100. Let's develop the habit of telling our women to actually be counting for us how many they have lost. By the time she's soaking five, you know you're actually heading um, into a dangerous point. Um, the rest of this is when you're either resuscitating the patient or at C-section. Again, being able to recognize that our mother has lost more blood and requires urgent help. So how then, after we have done our vital signs, how then do we proceed? Remember, there's a team leader who is driving 
who is driving the entire workforce so that there's no confusion in terms of who is doing what. Then the next person is passed to um, an IV access. In this IV access, they are drawing blood for an urgent grouping and uh, screening a full blood count, your coagulation screen. Two wide bore IV access, start running your fluids as you wait for blood and continuous monitoring every 15 minutes. Um, so this again confirms the workflow on how to go about it. We have called for help, our ABCs have been done, where we need to give oxygen we have given, we are running fluids. You may be giving the own negative blood as you wait for the group specific uh, blood and the blood products have also been called for, keeping the patient warm. After this, um, blood transfusion. After this, then we want to start knowing how to manage for the atony. Again, subsequent slides on the blood transfusion. You can be running O negative blood as you wait for the group specific blood. Um, if you have your normal cell lines, that's what will run. If you have your colloids, please run them. Your fresh frozen plasma, your platelet concentrates, and the cryoprecipitate as advised by the blood transfusion um, unit. Um, as we fix our IV access and running the fluids, always remember to insert your urinary, urinary sorry, bladder catheter to empty that um, bladder. At the same, same time, which is coming up, is to actually uh, perform the bimanual uterine massage. Okay. So we are still on managing the uterine atony. So the medical treatment, what I, the slide I'm looking for is actually this one, okay? The uterine massage should actually start as the IV axes are being placed. Um, this was just one which was placed wrongly. So once the page has been identified, call for help, one person on the IV axis, drawing the blood, running the fluid, the next person places the urinary catheter and the uterine massage needs to start. This is such a life-saving uh, technique. While this is happening, then now the medical treatment can start. We can run oxytocin. The unit here now will be 40 international units in 500 ml, will be run as a bolus. If that doesn't show any improvement, where we have egometry, we'll administer at 0 0.5 milligrams, slow IV or IM. Where we don't have that, or once you have administered that and there's no improvement, we will then switch to carboprost, 0.25 milligrams IM. Every 15 minutes, you can give up to eight doses. Misoprostol, 800 micrograms can be administered sublingually or parectally. And the one for the parectal dose, we go up to 1,000 micrograms. Please let's remember the role of tonexamic acid is to be initiated within 30 minutes of the diagnosis and certainly before three hours are over at a dose of one gram IV. So if my massage is continuing, we, have run, we are running our oxytocin, 40 units in 500 ml of pneumocelline run as a, as a bolus. These are to a patient who we already had had the active management of third stage of labor with the 10 units. Once you have run the bolus of 40 units, you can then put 20 units in 500 ml to run over two hours. Currently, we don't have any contraindications. The only thing to note is to make sure we don't run our patient into water intoxication. Um, Egometrin is the other dose that um, drug that I've mentioned. The dose is 0 0.2 um, IM um, only. If we are to use the 0 0.5, we can give as a slow IV. This can be repeated once every two to four hours. Careful to note, not to be used for patients who have hypertension, preeclampsia, coronary or cerebral artery disease. Alert the patient of the side, possible side effects being nausea, vomiting and or hypertension. As we are continuing with the resuscitation effort, let's always have somebody who is documenting for us, what are we giving at what time? So that now, once you have given a gometry, let's say at 10 a.m., we know the next dose is to be given probably at midday. Then in centers where we have carboprost, where there's no improvement, we can administer to 50 micrograms IM every 15 minutes to a total cumulative dose of two milligrams. That's eight uh, doses. So every 15 minutes it can be given. Either 
directly to the myometrium or IM, not to be used in patients who have asthma or an active pulmonary, renal, liver, or cardiac disease. The side effects to be expected are diarrhea and vomiting. Misoprostol, which is easily available in nearly all our units. The treatment dose is 600 to 800 micrograms per orally or 1,000 micrograms per rectal. Please note, once we administer this drug, please always alert the patient. They will develop this characteristic fever and shivering, which we know classically will resolve after three hours. They may also get some diarrhea nausea and abdominal pain. The beauty with misoprostol, it's easily available, doesn't need any whole chain for storage, quite a wonderful drug to always have uh, with us. Um, heat stable cabetosin, for those of us who have been lucky to use it, we have had a chance to appreciate this very strong myometrial contraction it actually gives the patient. So cabetosin, however, can only be used for prevention of PPH. And the dose is 100 micrograms by slow IV infusion. Again, I'll give a summary of the drugs that I'm mentioning in terms of what can only be used for prevention of PPH and what can only be used for treatment of PPH. We all know the, um, the tranexamic acid, which we indicated as part of the CHAMPION trial, one gram IV to be started within 30 minutes of diagnosis, certainly to be given before three hours are over because beyond the third hour, the effectiveness of this drug has actually not been found. Um, let's say you're in a setup where these drugs either are not available, some of them are available. What then do you do as you wait to transfer the patient to the next station? This aortic compression to minimize blood flow to the uterus can actually salvage the patient. How will you know the aortic compression is working? When you palpate for the femoral pulses and they are none. Um, okay, so this is the stage one, resuscitating efforts, medical management of the PPH. If that res doesn't resolve the uterine atony, remember we had said you have called the OB, you have alerted theater. This is a patient who needs to be taken to theater for further exploration and surgical management. As we transfer the patient to theater, we can be inserting the intrauterine, intrauterine balloon to tampon at the uterus. And then in terms of surgery, we will see what can be done. The surgical management of PPH are where the pharmacological measures which are available at the unit have failed to control the PPH. And this should be instituted sooner rather than later. So one of the intermediates, because we'll start with what we need to salvage this uterus before we eventually go to remove it, is the intrauterine balloon tamponade. In some hospitals, I believe perhaps the private uh, hospitals, they would have the Bakri balloon. In the centers where I work in, we will show you how you can modify this by simple use of a condom, a urinary catheter, and your suture to to assemble this uh, balloon tamponade. When done correctly, it can actually arrest bleeding in four to six hours, again, under close supervision of an, of an OB, so that if the vital signs are deteriorating, then we would go further for other surgical management. So this is what the Bakri balloon would look like. Uh, what most of us are aware about is the condom catheter. Some have actually used a sterile glove. This is the um, um, urinary catheter. At this point, you'll have to tie with, with one of the sutures. Commonly, we tend to use Vicryl, attach this to a giving set. You then run the nomoceline to tamponade the uterus. This could be either 250 or 350, whatever amount is able to tamponade that uterus. So this is what we largely use. This is the condom catheter. This is the, sorry, this is the condom, the... Um, urinary uh, catheter, the vicryl that we use at this point, whatever amount is enough to stop the bleeding. Important to note this patient will have to be covered with antibiotics, close supervision. In four to six hours, the bleeding should have stopped with improvement of vital signs. These are patients under constant monitoring, every 15 minute vital sign chart. 
so that if it, she doesn't improve, then we proceed on to the next uh, management step. Um, again, I've attached this paper of 2012. Uh, for those who are interested, we could read this. Certain um, centers, let's say if you really don't have the, you know, the condoms or the urinary bladder catheter, you can actually pack the uterus as you transfer this patient to a higher center. Let's be very, very clear. It is packing as we transfer the patient to a higher center. Uh, but now we look at hemostatic suturing. Please note, we are looking at the measures now surgically, but still to salvage the uterus. We have the B. Lynch uh, suture, which has been described by this amazing man since 1997. We also have the Heyman suture uh, described in 2002. The B. Lynch suture is what majority of us are very conversant with, that um, if perhaps it was a patient who we had ha done at a zero in section four, then three centimeters below the lower uterine segment incision, that will be the first entry point. Then you come roughly above four centimeters from the lower uterine segment incision, loop this uh, suture over the funders, come towards the back, approximating now where the loitering segment will be, loop towards this side, take the suture above to the funders, and this now will be coming anteriorly now on this side, four centimeters above the loitering segment incision, then come out three centimeters below the loitering segment incision, and then compress that uterus. A very good technique uh, when applied and can actually help salvage um, the uterus. The rest of the Heyman um, and Cho multiple square sutures, which have attached images uh, for us to have a look at. If this doesn't work, the B. Lynch um, technique, then it means we need now, now to do stepwise devascularization of the uterus. It could be one of the uterine arteries or both, it could be one of the ovarian arteries or both. Um, again, I've attached a paper of 2009 that shows how effective devascularization can be at arresting PPH and still salvaging this uterus. Diagrammatic representation, uh, we could, majority of us usually come at this point to ligate the uterine arteries. Sometimes it works, sometimes it will work. If it doesn't work, we can proceed to do the internal iliac ligation for those of us who have the experience with it. If we don't have the experience with it, don't feel too sad. There are still other things that we can do to salvage this patient. In centers where we are able to um, embolize the uterine artery, I do know the interventional radiologist will be part of the team members called upon when the PPH has been diagnosed. And that as we are heading to theater, interventional radiologists actually know that this is a patient that they need to intervene at some point. I put it here so that we can have a wholesome discussion. For the centers that have it, they would actually end up to embolize the uterine arteries, leading to salvaging of that uterus. Diagrammatic representation of how it would start, um, and then a time span for us to see the occlusion of the blood flow to the uterus. Um, in terms of success rates, the B. Lynch has been found to be successful in 90% of the cases. Arterial embolization has been found to be successful in 91% of the cases. Arterial ligation, 83%. The balloon tamponade successful in 83% of the cases. When all the salvaging maneuvers have not achieved arrest of the hemorrhage, we then proceed to perform a hysterectomy. And what then this means is, as we were admitting this patient, we profiled them in terms of their risk factor profile. As the PPH then was, the diagnosis was made, the patient was alerted to the possibility, we will try all the maneuvers to save the uterus, but in the event the bleeding is not controlled despite the salvaging maneuvers, then we'll end up removing the uterus. This is a clinical decision which is usually made by the most experienced clinician and the one who's actually able to perform it. Sometimes it could be a uterine rupture that despite all measures to repair that uterus, we can be able to. It could be on the spectrum of placenta accretors where we know it's actually sometimes either leave the placenta in situ or actually perform a 
hysterectomy at cesarean section. What then are some of the complications associated with postpartum hemorrhage? One is the need for transfusions. And I put this as bullet one because we do understand that we also take care of the Jehovah Witness population of patients who for them as part of their faith, they don't receive blood. And towards the tail end of this discussion as part of the q and I want to hear and to shed, have more of uh, the participants shed light on this because transfusions as we have seen will actually be one of the key components in saving life. Number two, we do know how scarce blood as a commodity is. And we do know actually, most of the times when we are losing our women, because actually we don't have this blood. The other complication is hysterectomy and the accompanying emotional, psychological impact it has on women. Yes, you have saved this client's life, but what does it mean for her to have her reproductive life come to an end at a time when she didn't choose? And that's why post-management of this patient, debrief and counseling is very important. These women, because of the severe mobility they have suffered, they will be at increased risk of developing thromboembolism. And so they need prophylaxis against venous thromboembolism. For some of them, hemodynamic instability will lead to organ failure. And we have seen some of them ending up in dialysis, developing heart failures, some of them ending up on vents for respiratory support, and even some of them ending up in liver failures. We have this very rare complication, but when it occurs, it actually hits your patient 100%. The Sheehan syndrome, where the patient ends up with postpartum hypopituitarism, because as we were managing for the hypovolemic shock, the pituitary gland underwent infarction. So this is a patient then who presents with failure to lactate with delivery. Soon after, she just doesn't get her period and she presents with all the manifestations of a failed pituitary gland. There's also the element of severe postpartum anemia. The importance of this is where the patient is not even able to take care of her own self, leave alone taking care of the newborn baby. How then can we prevent this or how then can we minimize this complication? We start from the preconception period where we want our ladies who are planning for pregnancy to come for preconception care and counseling. Check their HBs. How heavy are their menstrual cycles? How are their feeding patterns? Once we do the complete blood count, be able to interpret for her what are the red cell indices showing for her and offering corrective measures early enough. It goes beyond that IFAS. It goes beyond that Ranperon, Saffron, and all the other products that we have. It's then educating her about nutrition so that her HB levels are maintained above 12 actually before she conceives and during her entire pregnancy. And then once she conceives, routine standard antenatal care with iron supplementation. At week, between week 28 and week 32, repeat this client's HB. If it's anything less than 11, then go on an aggressive therapy to boost her iron. The number two, when she comes for admission during the clock shift, Let's develop the habit of categorizing our patient. Are you at low risk of PPH? Are you at high risk of PPH? Have we done an ultrasound? What's the estimated fetal weight of this baby? Take a proper history, including what her last deliveries were like. And then as we manage this mother, active management of third stage of labor, which we indicated was, we shall use, we shall administer 10 international units of oxytocin which actually has come from the fridge, not the one that we actually pulled at the start of crowning. Delayed cord clamping and controlled cord traction with counter traction. Okay, and this is actually, um, no, this is the by manual friend massage. Uh, yes, so the role of this while I was putting it here was, um, as this paper is putting it, is uterine massage important for management of postpartum hemorrhage? I have encountered certain midwives who will be telling the client, um, as you go to pass or to empty your bladder, be constantly massaging your uterus. Is there a role for that or not? And what this paper found is that once oxytocin and third stage of management of labor has been administered, we don't need to routinely be telling our women to do this. 
but I tend to think perhaps this is best practice in terms of where we are at. So this is the controlled cord traction of the placenta with counter traction. Um, then prophylactic use of uterotonics. If it's a vaginal delivery, uh, standard administration of oxytocin, 10 international units. If it's a C-section, usually we know we administer five international units, slow IV injection, always alert the patient to a splitting headache that lasts approximately 30 seconds. In certain centers, they would use egometry. In certain centers, they would use carboprose. Early pickup of PPH occurring. So the CHAMPION trial is actually what came to show us that carbetosin administered at 100 micrograms IM is actually more or less, because it was a non-inferior randomized double-blinded trial, is actually as good as oxytocin. And what this trial was trying to show is that in certain, in certain setups, where we're not able to maintain the cold chain, ask me, I work in Taraka, the temperatures there can get quite high. Then your heat table carbitosin will be a game changer in prevention of PPH. I'm coming towards the tail end of my presentation. We have the emotive trial, which attempts to use acronyms in obstetric units for us to manage the PPH. That for E, it starts with early detection what for my R will become recognize that the patient has lost 500 ml or more of blood and there's hemodynamic instability irrespective of the amount of blood loss. Immediately start by uterine massage after you have emptied the uterus. Then move to O where oxytoxic drugs are given. Is it oxytocin that you have? Is it misoprostol that you have? Um, is it tranexamic now becomes the T, but under O would also be, no, 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 sorry. Under O is oxytoxic drug and your misoprostol. Under T is a tranexamic acid, one gram, IV, slow infusion over 10 minutes. Then run your fluids. Under E, we'll examine the patient, establish which of the four T are we dealing with and escalate appropriately in terms of management. That's the emotive trial. Um, towards the tail end, a summary of the drugs that we have mentioned. Remember oxytocin can be used for both prevention of PPH, treatment of PPH. We use it for inducing labor. We use it for augmenting labor. We administer it either IV or IM, requires cold chain and a skilled healthcare personnel. Mysoprostol is used for both prevention of PPH treatment of PPH can be used for inducing labor. We don't use it for augmenting labor. Can be used in post-abortion and miscarriage care. Route of administration is either oral, sublingual, or pyorectal. Does not require a cold chain and does not need a skilled healthcare personnel to administer it. And we know there was a study that was looking at if we give it to women who want to deliver maybe at home, will it help with reduction of PPH. Perhaps this is something that the primary healthcare team will be looking at. Then we have the heat table carbitocin. Please note it's only for prevention of PPH, not for treatment, not for induction, not for augmentation, has no role in post-abortion and miscarriage care. We can give it IV or IM, 100 micrograms, does not need a cold chain, but will need a skilled healthcare personnel to administer it. Agometrin can be used for both prevention and treatment of PPH, not for use for induction or augmentation of labor, has no role in post-abortion and miscarriage care. We can administer it either IV or IM, requires a cold chain and a skilled healthcare personnel. Tranexamic acid is only used for the treatment of PPH. Please note, has no roles with induction of labor, prevention of PPH, augmentation of labor. Route of administration is only IV, does not require a cold chain, and requires a skilled health personnel for administration. So I've been thinking about the four hours of postpartum hemorrhage, which in summary will perhaps put this into perspective. That number one, as an obstetric unit, we shall always be ready for any patient 
who will have PPH? How do we ensure we are ready? One, that we have the appropriate knowledge skill set to manage a PPH patient. That means we do uh, simulation drills on the regular. We have protocols which are easily accessible in the unit. We have our PPH tray with all the supplies and checklists in it, where you actually know that if today I took panexamic acid, I replaced it before I left my shift. That we always have, at any one point in the shift, we have a response team. In the event today, we have a PPH patient and we say PPH, who then is coming to assist us with this client. Always being ready is number one. Then number two, that we are able to recognize and also prevent PPH. For every patient, then it means whether we are seeing them antenatally or at admission, um, or we are taking care of them during that labor process, we have been able to categorize our patient, low risk, high risk. And let's perhaps all agree, for any patient admitted for labor and delivery into any obstetric unit, they must always have an IV access. The number two, we always have a way of measuring cumulative blood loss. I know this will be highlighted adequately in the team that is presenting tomorrow, because by being able to know my patient has lost 700 ml of blood, being able to know from the vital signs that she, that the blood pressure, the systolic has come down by 30 and I need to resuscitate my patient. Active management, the third stage of labor, as a department-wide protocol. Now, once we've been able to recognize or prevent PPH, in the event it occurs, the third R is response, timely responding to the patient. So it shouldn't then be a problem to respond if our first R is in place. We know who to call. We know the protocols as to use it. The team leader takes us through the management of this patient in real time. Then support program for the patients, families, and staff is usually significant as part of the debris. Then after every management of a PPH patient, it's important to have this reporting system where then you are able to establish a culture of hurdles. What this means in, after we have managed this patient, we are able to come back and look at what did we do best, what did we miss, and how best can we, um, how best then can we be for the next patient. A multidisciplinary approach and review for the hemorrhage for the patients with PPH should form part and parcel of your monthly MPDSR. And I want to believe that nearly all obstetric units in this country do conduct their monthly audit of their department and that um, auditing the number of maternal near misses constitutes that MPDSR because I tend to think we learn more from the near miss than from a maternal mortality. And if we put PPH as something to audit, we'll always be becoming better in how to manage it. I'm going to leave you with this quote from our incoming FIGO president, Dr. Anne Kehara, on her thoughts about PPH. Is that PPH, we know it as one of the leading causes of maternal mortality and morbidity globally. Sadly, it is the women in low middle income countries and especially sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia who are paying the price. It is then for you and I to save the mother by stopping the PPH. From the roadmap that has been drawn by the WHO, there are four main pillars that they have identified. One, research investment on what works and how best to deliver proven PPH interventions, research. Number two, Developing norms and standards for every obstetric unit in how they manage their PPH cases. Number three, implementation and effective interventions being used for management of PPH. And finally, advocacy, perhaps, is the most powerful catalyst for global action that can help minimize PPH. And that's why we started this series by having all of us on the same platform, knowing what we need to address it. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Kanye. That was an amazing presentation. If we were in an audience somewhere, we'd give you a standing ovation. That was really, truly well done. Um, I'd, I'd like to go quickly into okay. our Q&A. Uh, okay. And we have quite a few concerns. But before I start, maybe this is an opportunity because there are very many questions around the CPD points. And um, just to allow my bells to get, uh, stop ringing, maybe the KNH research team can make a comment because most of our queries on the platform are around CPD to an extent that we can't even filter the, the um, questions relating to the presentation. KNH research team, maybe you can share a word to everyone who's asking about um, CPD points so that I can get this out of the way and then we can discuss the questions while Dr. Kani also uh, catches a sip of water. Uh, KNH research, anyone who can talk about this for a minute? Anyone on the KNH team? Okay, um, I'm sure they'll get back to us. Uh, KNH, please, when you can, please just What's let that? us know. KNH team, please let us know what's what's happening around the, the CPD points because uh, as we know, in October, we start renewing for our licenses and there's a bit of anxiety. Maybe you can tell us, KNH, uh, what to do. I need your speaker and your volume. Yes, KNH team, we can hear you. Oh, apologies, that was Dr. Dr. Kani. She's having a, a bit of technical hitches. Can you allow us to sort and we'll be back? Uh, we'll be able to answer the questions on CPD while we sort uh, Dr. Kanye first. Okay, please. Okay. So, because it's important, yeah? Um, and I don't know if Dr. Kanye is available to listen to questions as she's uh, sorting out her, her issues because we have quite a few questions. I would urge you to, to put them on the chat kindly. Oh, wow. You see, there are very many, but many of them are talking about CPD. So I'll try and go through them. Um, Dr. Kanye, you're ready? Yeah, but muted. Okay, great. So someone is asking. No, the um, issue is, I can't hear you guys. Oh, wow. Well. You can't hear us? Okay, maybe we can give her a minute. Mic check one two one two. Doctor, can you can you let me know that you can hear me? By mute, the boot off I hear. Yes, mic check one two. Mic check. Okay, I really cannot hear from the computer, but I can hear from the phone. Okay, so just uh, you you. She can use her phone, it's okay. Okay. You can hear me on the phone, right? That time? Yes, she's coming back on. She 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 can hear us through the phone. She'll be using the phone as as a, as the speaker. Okay, meanwhile, as she's settling in, please, KNH Research, just address this issue of CPD points kindly because, uh, yeah, people are a bit agitated. 
please. Uh, so for the CPD points is uh, as advised before, for KMPDC, uh -huh. all of the lists are uploaded to the ICPD portal. Um, sometimes you might find uh, maybe Apologies for the hitch. I was receiving another phone call, sorry. Um, so as advised, you are supposed to update your details. The details you give us should be the same details as the ICPD, which includes your board number together with your email address so that when we upload these details from our end to the ICPD, the automated system can pick your details and, uh, and uh, and assign you the tokens for that particular session. We have uploaded all the sessions, and uh, for now, what we, what we can do to assist is you will let us know which sessions you have attended, so that we can compare on our end, and also for the same to ICPD, so that we can be able to sort you. But uh, all the attendance lists have been uploaded, and uh, and uh, uh, we are working on uploading the rest. And uh, for the for the for the Enquiries and complaints we've received. Our CPD team is handling this and will be able to give you feedback through through your email. This might take some time because they, they will be combined through each and every session that you give us to, to try and ascertain whether you did attend this session. And if you did attend, uh, they will see uh, why you haven't received that point and they will be, be able to communicate uh, to you the reasons and uh, see how we can assist you further from there. For PPB, as advised uh, through the emails that we have been sending you as well, is that the, all our, our, our events have been uploaded to the PPB portal uh, and they are ready for subscription. Uh, the issue we are facing from our end is that not enough people are subscribing for the events they do attend. So if you are, if the people, uh, for example, if we have 300 attendees from PPB on our end today, and only 50 of you subscribe, it becomes difficult for us to be able to download and send those tokens to you. So we require each and every PPB member who's attended the, the sessions to subscribe so that we can be able to, we can be able to issue the points. For COC, um, uh, we do send the attendance list to the COC and they upload them themselves from their end and, uh, um, the points are issued automatically from the system. For NCK, uh, the points, are when they are ready, they are sent through email, and uh, you, you, you will receive a special code for the sessions that you have attended so that you can uh, redeem them on the, on the NCK portal. I think that is all from the from our side concerning CPDs. And as, 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 as advice before, if you have issues, you, you will raise them during the webinar so that we can uh, we can note this and also you can send us emails to KNH CPD. Our team is working around the, around the clock to try and uh, streamline all of these issues. So thank you once again for your feedback and also for for the for your inquiries and we uh, we are working on sorting you guys. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. But just a, 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 a comment to the KNH research team. There must be an easier way of doing this because um, asking me to tell you how many sessions I've attended were in September. I mean, and you have a session weekly. So those are very many and I probably am not keeping tabs. So the automated system is supposed to notice every time I log in and, and I register for a session. Um, so maybe at the back end, you can look to see how to make this process less painful less painful for everyone, yeah? Okay, so moving forward then. Uh, Moses Morithi is asking, uh, please shed some light on pneumatic anti-shock garments and if crepe bandages can be used to prevent cooling in the lower limbs, especially after PPH in theater. Dr. Tari? All right, um, the pneumatic uh, anti-shock garments, um, they have been found to be a low cost like first aid device that can be used for um, salvaging maneuvers for the management of PPH. 
However, personally, I haven't come into them, but from reading about it is that it can be, be used to reduce blood flow to the uterus and to treat the hypovolemic shock. Um, they have given success rates between 24 to 48 hours um, where the patient has actually managed to be transferred to a higher center where the postpartum hemorrhage can be now be managed by another team. So in actual sense, they're using it as an interim as you transfer the patient to minimize blood loss. Whether the compression, the cramp bandages can be used, I'm not very sure about that, unless someone else has better experience with them. Okay, very well, very well. Thank you very much. And uh, Trizia Mina is asking, how do you recognize on time that a mother is on PPH? Because this is sometimes or all the time delayed. I think that question has been answered. But maybe Dr. Kanye, as your men, as your Speaking to that, you can also talk about the delay in performing a hysterectomy because I've seen uh, sometimes we delay so much trying mm -hmm. to do all those procedures and that time the patient is still bleeding and still deteriorating. Um, yes. Is there is there a, a sign or is there a point at which you make a decision and say, okay, now we are we are going to extract or straight, or we are going to try this and we're going to try that because that delay sometimes can cost the patients. Like maybe you can talk to that a bit. All right. So um, as we institute the measures in the management of PPH, remember I say that one of the persons is documenting for us so that we're able to see how much time has really elapsed as we are instituting the salvaging maneuvers. If four hours have elapsed and the patient is still bleeding, quite hemodynamic, um, in, and quite unstable hemodynamically, you are probably running your third unit of blood and the patient is still bleeding, it is time to actually go and stop that bleeding. That's why the opening comment was all bleeding stops eventually. So it is for us to be the better judges of how much time has elapsed, how much have I used in terms of salvaging this uterus. So for example, I've explored all the uterotonics. I'm still atonic. I have put the uh, balloon tamponade. Patient is still hemodynamically unstable. I have put my b -linch. I would say be the better judge and continuously be monitoring your patient every 15 minutes. Definitely, certainly, you should be able to make that call. I can't be able to say at the second hour or the third hour, it is what that patient is demonstrating to you at that point in time. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here regarding the condom tamponade. Is there a need to warm the saline and um, explain the removal process? And close to that, how long will the mother stay with a tamponade in situ? All right. So in terms of whether to use cold saline or warm saline, whenever you can warm your warm saline, especially when you're administering your um, IV fluids, you can. But don't waste time warming your IV saline when probably one of the ones could be, could be running. So whether to use warm or cold, most of us have actually been using cold IV saline. In terms of how much do you use, it is the amount that you have infiltrated that has arrested the bleeding. So remember, as you infiltrate, then you're just observing how much of blood flow are you getting through the cervical os. So let's say you have put to 50 and there's no bleeding. So pretty much you would sit and 10 minutes just observe how much of bleeding is coming out. Is it too much to warrant adding an extra 50 cc's? Or can we actually hold at that point in time? So it is the amount that stops the bleeding. In terms of duration, many literature, many um, literature review that I've done is between, it's actually up to 24 hours, always cover the patient with antibiotics. Now, when it comes to the time for removing it, it was a slow deflation. So release 50 cc's, how is this bleeding going, 100, anything worrisome. And please remember, there will always be the normal lock here that the mother has to lose. So you slowly deflate now the amount that you had infiltrated as you observe how much bleeding is coming out. Again, perhaps this is a patient who should actually be monitored by the OB because now then it comes back to your earlier question that you don't delay too much in terms of doing a hysterectomy because you have this balloon tamponade that's perhaps lying to you. 
Thank you very much. Um, Winnie Muhia is, is just commenting and thanking everyone. She says she's a patient who has survived PPH twice. And uh, she says the protocols have saved her life and she's thankful to everyone who swung quickly into action. We thank God for that, Winnie Muhia. And there's an anonymous attendee who's asking, a HB of seven or eight or nine at 34 weeks and above, do you just transfuse or not? Okay, that's a very wide range, seven to nine. Of 34 that's weeks. A, that's quite a wide range. For nine, <laughs> the HB is nine. You would actually um, use your oral um, ion. If your HB is seven, you would give your oral ion. Then every two weeks, you check if the oral is working. If it's not, you can go to your IVs. Certainly, anything that is a HB of five will actually transfuse. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, after you try artery ligation, is there a risk of hypoperfusion? and infertility? Um, not quite, because remember we have the collateral um, circulation. So after your internal iliac ligation, remember you still have your collateral blood supply from the lumbar, middle sacral and superior hemorrhoidal artery. So in terms of total occlusion to the uterus because of the internal um, iliac artery ligation, I don't think so. And then in terms of infertility, not per se, to the best of my knowledge, because of the internal iliac uh, occlusion. They shouldn't confuse what we are doing with uterine fibroid embolization, which we know has some little bit of effect on future fertility. Okay, thank you. Um, as we are answering the questions, maybe you can put up the slide for measuring blood loss. You had put it up there with the pads. I think that's an important one for us to take screenshots and remember. And uh, someone is asking, what is the rationale for using primolute and tranexamic acid? Uh, uh, really? She's saying, okay, there are two questions that are related. What is the rationale for using primolute and tranexamic acid? They've not said for what? But someone is asking, in your presentation, you said to use it only for present prevention, but in the chat, you indicate only for treatment. For tranexanic acid, you can clarify on when is it being used, but meanwhile, maybe you can put up the slide on the pads. So okay. that we can- So tranexamic yeah. acid, we're using it for treatment of PPH. And then use of primolute in treatment of PPH, that one has no role. Okay, great. Okay. And uh, so prevention. No, it's not used for prevention, it's used for treatment. It's used for treatment, yes. Okay. Yes, it's treatment of PPH. Prevention, we said your misoprostol and oxytocin and cabetocin. Okay. Very good. Uh, for those who are requesting for the presentation, it will be uploaded on the KNH Research YouTube page, a YouTube channel. After a few days, you can find it there. Um, so Dr. David Ngunjiri is speaking to the question on the Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, she's saying, ask for a duly signed durable power of attorney beforehand during a commission and before CS that has a clause on patient wishes in the event of blood transfusion. Reassure that they will receive the best alternatives and discuss the implications as well as event of hysterectomy to save life. I think he's uh, uh, contributing to the Jehovah Witnesses debate. Um, I mm -hmm. think David, that is an ideal situation, but many times the patients come and they do not have they do not have anything. All they know is that they're Jehovah Witnesses and so you can't give them blood. So that is usually where your hands are tied. If you have documentation or a prior plan, it is usually not so much of a challenge, yeah? Um, I want to see any more questions as we come to the end. Dr. Nyongesa is saying, I usually use a sublingual misoprostol in prevention of PPH. Uh, with this practice, I have not had any issues. Could you please comment, uh, Dr. Ring? All right. Um, 
so what I've presented is are actually what the guidelines are. But we do know we always come down to the centers and we use what works best within our centers. I do not think it's wrong what it, what he's doing. He's the one who knows the bulk of the PPH clients that he gets. He's the one who knows at quite at the start what is the HB of the clients that he's having. If it's working for him and helping to address the bulk of the PPH cases, I wouldn't fault him for it at all. It is for us to then take the guidelines and tailor make them to meet the needs on the ground. Okay, great. Um, so what to award your question to all our witnesses, I think has been answered. It's, it's, a, it's not a simple, it's a very complex situation. And I think um, if you have a patient like in Italy who is Jehovah Witnesses, you need to you need to cover all the angles because you don't know what the patient will end up in terms of uh, delivery. But uh, it's usually critical when a patient lands on your table and uh, you are not prepared. It's difficult, yeah? Um, someone is asking, for the people who have placenta abduction during the intercalator, what's the difference between placenta abduction and placenta previa? Uh, please say that again, Joki. You're breaking up a little. So there are three issues here. Uh, placenta is a for PPH. Yes. So what's the difference between placenta? Uh, very quickly, as we come to the tail end of this discussion. Joki, I really haven't heard your question. You're breaking up. Placenta previa and abruptio. All right. So for the placenta abruptio. It's premature plus uh, premature separation of the placenta. For placenta previa, it is a low lying placenta where we are actually able to measure the leading margin. How many centimeters away is it from the cervix? Those are two separate entities. Premature separation and a placenta which is lying either too close within two centimeters from the cervix. Yes. Okay. Um, one last question. Kindly clarify for me at what point we are giving oxytocin during delivery. Previously, it, it was after the delivery of the anterior shoulder, and later it is after delivery. Confirmation of no twins. So are it we giving with, after delivery or the anterior shoulder? It is with delivery of the anterior shoulder because this is a lady you have been managing throughout labor. So you should have been able to pick whether it's a singleton pregnancy or it's a multiple gestation. So at the outset, what the guideline actually now at this point has confirmed, this is a singleton pregnancy or this is the last twin that's being delivered. So with this delivery of the anterior shoulder, we administer oxytocin. So that's why we have to actually enforce active management of labors in our unit. So now you're not caught up. Oh, there's another second twin. But when we were palpating, what were we checking for? Okay. And the last question. Uh, there are very many questions, really, and we really like the engagement. But because of time, I'd like to, to bring this to a close. What pain management protocols do you advise in labor? And is there a significant impact of pain management protocols on PPH? I think that's a good question. Please. Yes. So for the pain control protocols in management of labor, the one that we widely know has an effect in the management or in the occurrence of PPH is where there has been a use of epidural analgesia. We do know because um, we know now the timelines changes in terms of when we have had delayed second stage with somebody who has an epidural analgesia. The labor is likely to be longer in a patient who has epidural analgesia. So yes, epidural analgesia has actually been known to increase the occurrence of postpartum hemorrhage. The other pain control measures is where we use um, uh, tramadol with paracetamols, always alert your pediatric team when you have used them. Uh, naloxone has also been used as a pain control during labor and delivery. That's the best of my knowledge is that epidural analgesia does increase the occurrence of PPH. Okay, and this is to the KNH research team. Mtwapa Sub County Hospital, they joined as a team from one hall. Isn't that amazing? They're asking how they can receive their points. Kindly advise 
I'm sure they can write to you separately. In Topa Sub County Hospital, please engage the KNH research team on the side and they can advise you on how to receive your presentation, your CPD points. Um, PPH calls for a theater exclusive to drop for maternal cases, and this should be a key point in advocacy. I agree. Yes, that is important. Yeah. So um, I, I'd like to bring this discussion to a close because of the time, and to really thank thank everybody who has taken part today. I mean, the turnout was amazing, and to thank. Uh, Dr. Kanye, that was an amazing, amazing presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm sure you can avail the slides to, to the team and then they can have it. And so to, to, to encourage everyone to keep having this discussion and to keep being on the lookout for PPH so that unfortunately we do not lose a mother or have a negative outcome because of postpartum hemorrhage. And also to welcome you we have more sessions tomorrow. We have a very good one at 7 p.m. Um, advancing PPH management during the calibrated drapes and bundled approach of care with lessons learned from the emotive trial. And we have a host of amazing speakers, Professor Kureshi, Dr. George Guaco, Dr. Alfred Osotti, Professor Anthony Wanyoro, Dr. Alan Nicole, and Dr. Joanne Okemo, all consultant obstetrician gynecologists and moderated by Dr. Aurora Maranga. It will be one discussion you do not want to miss. So tomorrow, 7 p.m., as we continue the discussion on PPH. So I'd like to thank you all for this afternoon. I'd like to thank KNH Research for your platform that is able to host so many people and thank you all for your engagements and to wish you a good afternoon. Thank you.